Good day, Dr. Mayer. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Please allow me to read this introduction of you before we start so that uh, I give a little background here for our audience. Dr. Richard E. Mayer is an educational psychologist from the University of Michigan, best known for research and contributions to the field of educational psychology, especially his multimedia learning theory, which states that optimal learning occurs when visual and verbal materials are presented together simultaneously. He was the recipient of the E.L. Thorndike Award in 2000 for career achievement in educational psychology, as well as the 2008 Distinguished Contribution of Applications of Psychology to Education and Training, both from the American Psychological Association. Dr. Mayer is the author of more than 500 publications, including 35 books on education and multimedia. And he has been ranked number one as the most productive educational psychologist in the world. I read some time back that you were the most cited author in our field. Thank you so much for your contributions. Dr. Mayer is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he has served since 1975. Rich, thank you for agreeing to do this Skype interview with me today. Is there anything in my intro that needs updating? Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Very kind um, introduction. That was um, very nice. And I'm glad to be here with you and I try to answer your questions. Well, thank you. I was watching a video of you the other day uh, speaking at the University of Kentucky back in 2018, and you said that you were from the Cincinnati area. Can you tell us a little bit more about where you were born, where you grew up, et cetera? Sure. sure. I was born in Chicago, and then when I was still an infant, my family moved to Cincinnati. So I grew up in Cincinnati. Um, I went to Cincinnati public schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, then for college, I moved on to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, about 30 miles up the road from Cincinnati. Um, and then I majored in psychology. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to graduate school at University of Michigan, also just up, up the road a bit in Ann Arbor. Um, so that's kind of a quick history. Um, my first job was at Indiana University. I was there for two years as a visiting assistant professor. And then um, I had the incredible fortune to land a job here at University of California, Santa Barbara, where, I, where I've been ever since. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the program that you are involved with there? I'm in the uh, psychology department, although we've changed our name to uh, Psychological and Brain Sciences. Um, and I'm in uh, an area of the department that focuses on um, cognition, perception, and cognitive neuroscience. So I'm kind of holding down the, the, uh, the folks who study um, learning and cognition. Mm -hmm. And what I, um, I, and I work with a lot of grad students and undergraduates in that area. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your first exposure to human performance technology, even though you may not use that term, but uh, basically evidence-based practices for performance improvement? And I know your focus is in learning, but uh, sure. can you share with us a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, from the very start, my, my um, graduate program at the University of Michigan was in a research center called the Human Performance Center, and it was very oriented towards trying to improve human performance. So I guess that was really my initial introduction to graduate school. And we had a um, number of people on uh, at that center who were focused specifically on um, more motor aspects of performance, but I was more interested on in cognitive aspects of performance. But I would say from the very start, I've been interested in how can you help people learn so that they can use what they learn to solve new problems. So that, that, and that's really what we're looking for a lot of the time in, in uh, human performance improvement. We want people who are innovative, creative, can use what they've learned. How do, how do we really build that kind of expertise? That was kind of the original, those were kind of the original questions I had as a grad student. Mm -hmm. 
Can you share with us some of your biggest influences back then, uh, people or articles or books that uh, others may want to follow up with? That's really an interesting question. I think I was just influenced by everything, but in the area of performance, let me think. Uh, uh, maybe the work of um, Bob Gagne. I thought um, the way he analyzed things made a lot of sense to me, and he also was personally very encouraging to me, which I appreciate. You really appreciate that when you're beginning in a field and one that the illuminaries yeah, actually knows, seems to know you. That 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 was a big boost to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, Dave Merrill, I think, um, also influenced me and just also in the way he could organize and synthesize big ideas. Um, and going back further, you know, I, Oh, I, I would say those are the folks who influenced me the most. Okay, thank you. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do as a model for others to follow, uh, what would you share with us? Um, I mean, in terms of um, research? What am I yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, if, you, if you're at a cocktail party and somebody says, uh, Rich, what do you do? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I would say what I've been trying to do is what I would call apply the science of learning to education and training. So we know a lot about how learning works. We've been studying it for more than 100 years. But a lot of that research was initially based on animal lab kind of study, animal studies and then kind of artificial lab studies. And it really hasn't been until fairly recently that the field of learning has kind of turned to more practical education and training type issues. So I've been really interested in what does the science of learning have to tell us about how to design instruction? Um, and in particular, I'm interested in how can we help people learn in ways so they can take what they've learned and apply it to new situations. So that's the that's really the classic issue of transfer. How do, how do you teach for transfer what are instructional methods that are effective? What are training procedures that are effective? And helping people, people be able to perform well on a transfer test. Um, so some of the issues I've gotten involved in over the years um, are things like, how do you design multimedia instruction? If you're trying to teach people about a scientific or mathematical concept, um, how, how would you design um, a short instructional program to help them understand it using both graphics and words. So that we have a number of principles of multimedia design that are evidence-based. Um, and one of the themes of that work really is that we should take an evidence-based approach to how we design our instruction because there is now evidence. We can, we can build what we're doing based on evidence. Um, I've also kind of gotten interested in game-based training. Can we use games for... Uh, helping people develop cognitive skills. There's a lot of hope that we can do that, and there's, but there's not a lot of evidence yet that we can do it. So we've been trying to develop games to teach um, executive function skills like um, updating or shifting, and we've had some success, so we're kind of encouraged to continue looking at how we can design games based on cognitive theories of training. And what else? Oh, and also recently we've kind of gotten involved with uh, learning in virtual reality to see if um, we can use VR as a platform for helping people learn better. It has a lot of motivational benefits, but um, there's still not a lot of evidence that it's really all that effective for a lot of the kinds of skills we're trying to teach. So we kind of want to look at how can we make it as effective as possible. So does that all make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, could you please go through some of your principles that uh, I've, I've heard you and read uh, that you've talked about, coherence, signaling, et cetera? Could sure. you give us a little snapshot for the audience of each of those? Sure. I mean, we um, my research program on multimedia design really is focused on the what I would call the multimedia principle, which is the idea that people learn better from words and graphics than from words alone. So if you're trying to explain how something works, like how a bicycle tire pump works or how lightning storms develop or something like that, you could just explain it in words. 
but we find that when you ask people to use that information, um, they're not very good at performing on problem-solving tasks involving that information. But if we add graphics that um, um, support the text, um, then people do much better on transfer tests. So that kind of got me interested in this idea that multimedia instruction can be a lot more powerful than just verbal-only instruction. But the problem is not all graphics are equally effective. So we have to kind of look and see, well, how can we use graphics? So some of the principles we've come up with, you mentioned coherence, which is, I can't claim it as mine. It's a very basic principle that any designer would tell you is um, uh, uh, eliminate any extraneous material from the um, instructional um, materials. So don't have graphics that aren't relevant, don't have words that, are, that aren't relevant, just focus, just, just keep it simple. That, that's kind of the coherence principle. And we find that doing things like adding interesting but irrelevant details to a lesson, um, students like it more, but they actually learn less. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we call that seductive details. Um, so that's the coherence principle. Let me think of it. Another kind of uh, interesting one is what I call spatial contiguity. Not the easiest thing to say, mm -hmm. but this is the idea that printed words and printed words should be placed next to the part of the graphic they're talking about. So instead of having a caption underneath the graphic, the problem with that is you have to scan back and forth between the words and the graphic. You waste a lot of processing capacity doing that. Um, and since working memory is limited, that means you can't really think about what it means. If we put the words next to the part of the graphic they're talking about, then people can make that connection between the words and the graphics. And that's really what understanding is all about, seeing how the words and graphics relate to each other. So that's kind of spatial contiguity. Let me think of uh, other ones that are fun. Um, uh, segmenting. Uh, uh, the segmenting principle is when you have a very complicated very complicated material, so you, you can't really simplify it um, because the content itself is just complex. So one thing to do is to break it into smaller parts and make sure people master one part before you move on to the next part. So that's the segmenting principle. And one last one, um, personalization. It's more of a social um, idea that um, people seem to learn better when the words are in conversational style rather than formal style. So Using first and second person, like saying I and you and we, that helps people learn better than just always using third person. Maybe because um, learners can kind of form a social bond with the instructor and therefore try harder to understand what the instructor is saying. Um, so that, that's a sampling of some. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Can you share with, you mentioned uh, a virtual reality VR. Is this the current focus or your next focus for study? Um, well, some of our research is. I wouldn't say it's our main focus, okay. but it's it's an interesting avenue we're going down because the, um, you know, you can now buy systems for um, what seems like not a lot of money. I, I first, my first VR study we did in around 2000 and the equipment cost about $25,000 to build and it it was not that accurate. It caused people to have motion sickness sometimes because it, the time lag wasn't perfect. But now you can buy equipment that's very compelling, doesn't generally cause any kind of motion sickness, and is, like I said, it only costs a few hundred dollars. So a lot of people think this is going to revolutionize education, but um, so I, I kind of want to look at how we can use VR. Um, so far, we have found VR is kind of distracting to people, and we have to kind of add features to, to keep people focused on the main point, mm -hmm. like asking them uh, at intervals to summarize what they just learned. That helps them reflect on what's going on. <laughs> well, thank you. Is there a favorite uh, performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you'd like to define for us? And I ask this question because some people are unhappy with the where our vocabulary is in our profession and perhaps they see a term or a phrase being what they perceive to be misused. Is there is there something that you can share with us? Well, Pet peeve, 
favorite phrase, something? <laughs> well, I like the phrase evidence-based practice, which I see you talk about, mm -hmm. because I think it's very important to base what we're doing on what the research evidence says. It doesn't mean that the research evidence is always going to tell us exactly what to do in a practical situation. It just means I think we should be informed by what's known. Um, and um, so, yeah, I would say evidence-based evidence, evidence -based practice is a term I like. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Let's explore uh, some more a little bit about the back in the day when you when you first started in and uh, and perhaps even more currently. But um, are there people uh, that you've worked with in the past that uh, um, you would like to tell us a little bit about? Uh, you and I discussed this before we hit the record button on this, and uh, you had mentioned uh, Ruth Clark. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know you've done a lot of or you've done some work with Ruth Clark, but what can you share with us about uh, Ruth? Sure. Well. I, I met Ruth um, many years ago at a conference. I can't even remember what the conference was, but I do remember specifically where I met her. It's kind of etched in my mind. We were both pulling our carry-on luggage across um, uh, a parking lot, and she kind of uh, said, um, well, Rich, you've done a lot of really interesting work that's published in good academic journals. Um, would you like anybody to actually use it? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I think I would. <laughs> and that kind of began our uh, decades-long collaboration, especially uh, on our book, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, which is now maybe in its fourth edition, um, where we, we tried to take the evidence about uh, multimedia design and present it in a way that would be usable by practitioners, but still be based on research evidence. So we kind of wanted to show how evidence, how you could use evidence to um, design instruction. So she kind of got me thinking about that, about the practical side of my research, and um, I really appreciate, <laughs> I really appreciate what she did. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, anything else, uh, uh, anybody else from the past or uh, maybe more recently that you work with that uh, you have a stories with? Um, probably ones I shouldn't tell, so I, I'll tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. I, 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 you know, one thing you they don't teach you in grad school is that this is a very collaborative business. So I've really been fortunate to be able to collaborate with people all over the world, sometimes not even in person, just, you know, over email or, or Skype or something. Um, but it, it's just so wonderful to have so many collaborators because when you work in a multidisciplinary field like I do, I get to work with really smart people who have, you know, different kind of different goals, maybe an interest than I do. And that really is a broadening experience. So I do appreciate all the people I've had the chance to work with. Well, thank you. Uh, Rich, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this video interview with me. But, but my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance that, for our audience, especially people that are new to the field? What, what, would, what would your guidance be for them? Um, well, I think it, it's a fantastic field because um, it kind of takes what we know about how the human mind works, how learning works, um, and it uses it in a very optimistic way to kind of have this hope that we can actually help people improve themselves. We can help people get better, develop, and learn. And I think that's the, um, that's the thing that distinguishes our species from other species. We have the ability to learn, to change, to adapt, and so, um, if we can develop ways to facilitate that process, I think that's a huge contribution to society. So I think, you know, what we're doing in this field is um, important. Thank you so much. Rich, thank you again. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all your contributions and your willing to spend a little time with us today. Have a great day. Sure. Thank you very much, Guy. I really appreciate it talking with you. Thank you.